Hey everyone, thanks so much uh, for tuning in as we kick off the uh, first of our uh, faculty webinar series at the Golisano Institute for Sustainability. Um, please tune in later this week and next week as some of my esteemed colleagues will be talking about some of their uh, research areas as well. Uh, I apologize for some of the technical difficulties. We're going to have to show uh, the slides uh, this way, but hopefully um, you still get to can see everything okay on your end. So uh, I'm a material scientist by training, and I, so I look at the complexity of material systems uh, from, over the entire life cycle because we're here at a sustainability institute and very, very interested from sort of all the way from extraction to use to their end of life, which includes recycling and reuse pathways, as well as disposal. So today I'm going to talk about a small piece of that work uh, that's looking at the uh, availability of resources or materials uh, for launching new clean energy systems. So to first think about this, I want everyone to think about their cell phone. Can't get it to move forward. <laughs> Just one second. Just do it from there. Can you see if it's going to work? Or? Yeah, OK. OK, hopefully you see the next slide. It's an iPhone. <laughs> so if we think about our iPhones, which are now ubiquitous, or even just the smartphone in general for all of you Android users or Google phone users, um, there's a lot of materials in one of these uh, pieces of uh, equipment now. And if we think about how much that's changed over just a relatively short amount of time, you can see that uh, product complexity is increasing substantially. So thinking about our iPhone, right, we have a bunch of materials that are needed to keep the screen lit up. So those include things like indium and tin, aluminum, uh, silicon metals. Um, we also need to keep it very light in terms of having it in our pocket. We don't want it to be very heavy. And we also need to have mobile power. And so all of our phones have batteries in them. And so we need things like lithium, uh, cobalt, uh, different types of carbonaceous materials like graphite in the anode to make that uh, able to work and have power on the go. Also, uh, we really like the uh, beautiful uh, pictures that we see. We watch movies now on our phones. And so we need our screens to be very bright. So there's a variety of rare earth elements uh, that are required to enable our screens to do that. Things like yttria, lanthanum, um, terbium, uh, rare earth magnets like dysprosium, praseodymium. Uh, we also have speaker units in them, right? Because we use them for talking and listening to said movies. Uh, so we need things like nickel, uh, terbium. Again, those magnetic materials are in the speaker system. So our dysprosium, praseodymium. And then all of the basic circuitry that's within the phone. So we, we need precious metals for that, like silver and gold. Um, we have flame retardants in the plastics um, in our phones now. So we need things like bromine, um, arsenic, boron, potassium, copper for all the wiring. And so this isn't even a comprehensive listing of all of those materials within the phone. So if we, if we really think about this, the number of materials that we're using is increasing exponentially. So in magnitude, meaning we're just consuming more things, more people have phones, and we're, we're getting uh, more phones um, uh, faster, right? So new every two, or maybe you drop yours and need yours even less than two years. But then also along with the actual magnitude of consumption increasing, uh, the products and the systems are becoming much more diverse. So that was true in our iPhone case, uh, right, where we talked about, you know, there's, there's tons of different materials in there, you know, 35 plus different types of materials. And it's also true for energy systems. So our energy systems right now are evolving extremely rapidly. Um, obviously, we're trying to move away from fossil fuel. We want to have lower impact uh, energy production. And so a path to enable that is likely going to be a very diverse portfolio of other energy systems and energy production. So this would be, um, you know, our photovoltaics, um, wind turbines, uh, new uh, high, highly efficient um, natural gas uh, uh, energy producers, right? So as, as we're going to move along this path, 
uh, really the portfolio is going to be extremely diversified. And one of the questions that I'm looking at are what materials are going to be needed to enable that transition. So if we look here at the periodic table, you can see a wide range of materials that are needed for some of these new clean energy technologies. So um, the little lightning bolts show all the different materials that are needed for batteries that we need for storage or electric vehicles. Um, the little stars are for our photovoltaics, so that's our solar technologies. And then the little kind of uh, triangly diamond is for motors and generators. So those are needed both for electric vehicles and for things like wind turbines. Now you'll also see a uh, varying degree of redness on, on each of these materials in the periodic table. So the darker red means that those materials are considered more critical. And that's something that I study here at the Golisano Institute for Sustainability. So what is criticality? Um, if we just look up sort of the uh, dictionary definition, there's two key definitions there. One is this idea of being crucial or indispensable. And the other is this idea of being in or approaching a state of crisis. Both those definitions are true for when we think about the criticality of materials as well. So the first part of criticality is really thinking about where are they needed? What are their high demand applications and how important are those applications? And then the second is what is the risk of there being some disruption to their supply? So criticality you can think of as being sort of a sustainability metric for how we think about material resources. So it's a way for us to communicate the degree of risk with the use of these. And so figuring out how to measure this riskiness of using these, these materials is very complicated because there's a lot of different ways in which a supply chain disruption could happen. So the first is actual just physical scarcity, how much of that material is there, right? And so the, we use metrics that have to do with the amount and the quality of a resource that's actually physically present or physically determined, how much of this is actually in the earth. So we might use something like ore grade or the cost of a material to sort of reflect, um, you know, how much is there and how easy is it for us to extract it. There's a second uh, set of metrics that we use to think about scarcity and criticality that I kind of uh, put together into institutional inefficiency. So these are failures by markets or firms or governments that result in some kind of transitory resource unavailability. So in this case, the material might actually be there, right? There's plenty in the ground, but something else has occurred that might cause us uh, to not be able to get to that material. All right, so on the physical constraint side, just a little bit of historical perspective. People have been thinking about this for a long time. Uh, Thomas Malthus actually was the first to write about how extraction will eventually exhaust resources. So this was a long time ago, and already we were starting to think about the fact that the more that we take, say the ore grade is going to decrease as we extract more. So those types of metrics are called Malthusian. Uh, another um, sort of philosopher in this space was uh, David Ricardo, and he, he actually uh, was more of an economist in the space where he wanted to add the fact that resources exist at differing quality level, right? So that scarcity actually comes from this increasing difficulty and cost of access. So now we're starting to get at metrics that get also to the institutional inefficiency side slightly. So those are Ricardian metrics, and they're also usually focused more on price. So the first thing that we have to do to understand this problem for particular materials is do a physical resource quantification. So where are these materials coming from and what are their quality, right? And so this is, this is how a material scientist gets involved in this type of research because the fundamental question is really material characterization. And we're not just talking about primary materials here where they would come from a mine or an ore. We really also want to know what's the possibility for getting these materials from secondary sources or recycling. So once those products reach end of life, what's the likelihood that we can collect them and then recover those materials? So there's kind of those two, two ways of looking at that issue. On the institutional inefficiency side, uh, these can actually have really uh, long, lo uh, large reaching global impacts as well. So this is an example for cobalt. So back in 1977, uh, there was a country called Zaire, which no longer exists. It's now the Democratic Republic of the Congo, or the DRC. And they, they hold quite a bit of our cobalt resources, mainly uh, via copper mining. 
uh, because cobalt is a byproduct of copper mining. And so, and, th and this is true still today, the DRC holds uh, a large magnitude, uh, you know, 40 to 55% of all uh, cobalt resources. So there was a rebellion in 1978 that led to a short-term supply constraint. And you can see that that graph on the lower left is actually the real price of cobalt over that time. So that small rebellion actually led to a massive price spike in cobalt, which had huge supply chain issues. Um, uh, there was geographic supply relocation that came out of it. A lot of companies had to scramble and figure out how to substitute out cobalt. Um, also, uh, some companies went out of business because they were marginal producers. A lot in the semiconductor industry was hurt uh, during this price spike. But then also uh, innovation um, environmentally happened because of this as well. Um, uh, more efficiency was seen in production processes and increased recycling occurred. So there's both negative and positive uh, consequences of these types of price spike events uh, that happen because of supply chain disruption. One of the challenges for clean energy materials is that this flow is not necessarily completely straightforward. And that's because many of these material systems are actually very interconnected. So I gave um, the example for that, for that cobalt case where actually there's really no direct mining of cobalt, maybe just a little bit. Most of it actually comes from copper and nickel mining. So if one wants to know how much cobalt's available, uh, you can't just ask that question, you actually have to ask how much copper or how much nickel is being produced. And many, many of these uh, important critical materials for our clean energy systems are also these byproduct or co-product uh, type relationships with a carrier metal. So you can see uh, in the periodic table chart there, as it gets more um, yellow to orange to red, that's actually how much of that material is being derived as a byproduct of another material. So you can recognize some of those important materials that we already talked about for both electronics and clean energy are quite red. So almost 100% of, of their production relies on the production of another material system. This, uh, the circle here is actually showing kind of the interconnectedness of material systems. So the, the inner dark circle is actually all of the carrier metal cycles. And then you can see as you go out along the wheel, all of these byproducts and co-product metals that are, that are extracted uh, alongside those carriers. So this makes it really challenging to actually assess how to mitigate or deal with risks from supply chain disruptions. So if we think about um, an ore being extracted, so this lower left is sort of this idea of a mixed ore, you're going to process that and then you're going to create sort of a, this primary base metal and then this little black dot is showing your, your co-product metal, right? And that's what those critical materials are, right? So the fact that these material systems are connected makes it hard to understand when to employ either technology interventions or policy interventions along the life cycle of both of those materials to better understand will there be enough. There's also an economic complication, which is what this bottom right chart is showing. So usually what happens with production is if you want more of a material, right, so there's high demand, then that high demand will actually raise the price of it, and therefore they will extract more. The problem is, is if you're a co-product, if there's higher demand, say, for cobalt, that might not necessarily mean that or translate to more demand for copper or nickel, the carrier metal. And therefore, those, um, the, the, the increased demand really has to move the price even further in order to see any movement in terms of extraction or processing of those base metals. So there's, there's a lot of challenges uh, in this space to, to better understanding this. So I'm going to share just a couple cases uh, in the clean energy system for looking at scarcity and criticality. Um, and um, the first is for lithium ion batteries. Uh, so here um, you can see part of the motivation for this, right? So uh, there's extremely uh, aggressive uh, forecasts for uh, production and adoption of electric vehicles. And of course, that's going to eventually result in a very large waste stream. So uh, our group has done some work looking at what cumulative outflows of these materials might be. And it could be as much as 4 million uh, metric tons of these cells generated 
uh, between 2015 and 2040. This is actually assuming uh, some fairly conservative uh, scenarios uh, for, for EV adoption as well. Um, and you can also see um, that uh, uh, what the makeup of those materials are. So there's a lot of steel, but then a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, other other materials as well. And the high value ones are in the cathode and the anode. So the cathode has those thin films. That's where we see our lithium and cobalt and other high value materials. So if we look at the supply chains for these materials, one thing that you'll notice right away is strong geographic concentration. So um, these are some, some important materials for batteries, nickel, manganese, cobalt, lithium, and then carbon, mainly um, we're looking at the graphite anodes um, in this case when we say carbon in this case. And then if we look at where most of the production is taking place, you can see for several of these, uh, it's, it's very concentrated. So um, a large majority of our graphite anode production is taking place in China. Um, a large amount of our lithium production is split sort of between Australia and Chile. And then as I stated before, the DRC uh, still has uh, most of the production of cobalt occurring there. So this can be problematic uh, because if the supply is very concentrated, then it's going to be much more vulnerable to supply disruptions. So it could be things like socio-political upheaval, like the example of the DRC in the past. Um, but it could be something as simple as weather, where um, you know strong rains in regions of Chile actually are going to disrupt brine production, for example, because too much water gets into into their uh, the large fields where they're where they're drying those uh, lithium carbonate equivalents. Also, uh, the more concentrated it is, the more likely that manufacturing bottlenecks could take place. So, um, uh, geographic concentration is just one way of of looking at uh, potential for these supply disruptions. So, if we take that metric and plot it against how much material there actually is, we could generate a chart that looks like this. So that bottom axis is fraction in top country. So as you're moving to the right, it's more geographically concentrated. And the other axis is reserve over primary mine production, right? So this is giving us an idea of, of how much material is actually available for extraction. One thing you'll notice about this is it's very dynamic, right? So um, these things are changing over time. So, for example, for the case of cobalt, between 2005 and 2015, you'll see that those marks have moved to the right, um, which means actually more geographic concentration has occurred over the last decade. Um, for the case of lithium, you'll actually see that uh, the fraction in top countries, so the geographic concentration, is mainly the same, but has gone up quite a bit uh, between 2005 and 2015. This is actually because um, geologists have spent quite a bit of time better identifying where uh, deposits and areas, uh, potential areas for mining might be for lithium. So we've actually discovered a uh, much more extractable lithium over that past decade. And you can see uh, there's not been a lot of movement for things like manganese and nickel. These are more established, um, larger volume material markets. And then also for the case of natural graphite, uh, you'll see we've, we've again, also explored more and found, found more places where we'd be able to get that material. And of course, uh, we can also create man-made graphite. So if we look at that supply chain, you can see very strikingly for the case of cobalt how there's few dominant players here. So this is actually showing the trade flows in millions of US dollars. And you can see really a vast majority is in just that one flow between the DRC and China. So the DRC is um, extracting the cobalt resources and then they're being refined and processed and used uh, mainly in China. And you can see too here where most of that is coming both from the copper and the nickel mining. For the case of lithium, you can actually see quite a bit more diversity. So again, you're seeing a large uh, amount coming from, from Chile to China. So um, that's still, that's still um, a dominant flow, but you can see there's a lot more, more diversification here. And you can also, um, as, as I showed in uh, the previous chart, the resource and reserve estimates are still expanding for that case. 
So the next example I'm going to share with you is for solar or photovoltaic materials. So when we started with uh, generation one, our crystalline silicon uh, solar materials, we really just had one active material. But you can see that as this technology is evolving, we're incorporating more and more materials. And you'll notice from the list, some of those that I spoke about previously as being quite critical, things like indium, tellurium, selenium, and gallium. So we might have some concerns in the supply of these materials that could have an impact on solar adoption. So as one example of this, let's take tellurium, which is uh, the main one for CAD tel cells, which is a Gen 2 solar technology. So tellurium is produced solely as a byproduct of mainly copper production. So you can see here that we have our copper production, which ha can have different processing forms. So most of our copper sulfide ores are going to be electrolytically processed. But there's another type of processing called SXEW, which is an electro-winning process uh, that's starting uh, to be uh, more and more so uh, the route for copper production, as well as secondary. So that would be uh, being produced from recycled copper. So from the electrolytic processes where we start to see that copper byproduct that contains tellurium, and then that tellurium can be extracted from that and make its way into cat tel cells. So of course there's a lot of complication in, in predicting how much of that tellurium may be available. It has to do with the material intensity of the PV cells themselves. So we look at, say, the film thickness as a proxy for that material demand in that sector. It's going to depend greatly on what PV growth uh, actually is in terms of demand and adoption. So that's slightly uncertain. Also, we don't know which of the technologies might actually uh, win out in this case. Will it be cad -Tel or will it be a new Gen 3 technology or perovskites or whatever is, is next in the, in the development chain. Also, we don't really know what the growth rates for copper production in and of itself. So currently, copper production is quite stagnant or even declining, which may indicate less tellurium that would be available via the copper extraction route. And then it also depends on the yields of the processing um, stages as well. So all of these things go into trying to predict if we will have enough material. So you can see this top chart is actually showing tellurium, which is both supply and demand. So you can see here supply and then what predicted demand might be. And of course, when you, when you see those things crossing, that's showing a gap condition where we would have some market imbalance. So basically what we're saying is, if PV demand increases substantially, but copper production is staying stagnant, then we could foresee a future where we wouldn't have enough tellurium coming out as a byproduct for that case, which would then cause some sort of um, you know, price response, right? So as, as that material becomes more scarce, we would expect the price to increase, which could have a detrimental impact to adoption of those PV technologies. So of course, we don't want to just quantify the problem. Really, we want to look at solutions uh, to, these, to these criticality issues and things that businesses can do or policy uh, makers could potentially intervene in the market as well. So this, uh, the bottom right chart is now quantifying how sensitive those gap conditions would be to certain types of mitigation strategies. So on the demand side, for example, we could look at that growth rate, right? So how, how much PV is being adopted. We could also uh, look at material intensity, right? So of course, um, scientists are busy trying to make those thin films even thinner because we want uh, the solar cells to be extremely efficient as well as lightweight and low cost. So they're, they're trying to work at bringing down those material intensities. On the supply side, um, we could look at, say, secondary copper, right? So this would be recycling or the yield process itself. And so this type of quantification can then help us make recommendations based on that. So short term, we could look at improving yield and reducing material intensity, but it's going to take much longer, so midterm to long term, to be able to develop things like recycling infrastructure or trying to advance direct mining of tellurium, where we would try to get tellurium out of the ground on its own instead of just as a byproduct of something like copper. So we can also then look at part of the embodied energy of that as well. So this is actually looking at quantifying criticality or the risk from these materials 
um, from both a primary price and a primary embodied energy perspective. So we can layer these types of metrics together to help us understand what the riskiness of some of these might be. And as I you know, stated previously, we're really very focused on solutions, right? And so the reality uh, in most of these systems is uh, we're, it's gonna require quite a bit of cross-disciplinary work and also across the entire life cycle. So in the extraction side, um, we can be using a lot of uh, new geology or extractive metallurgy techniques to get at looking at primary mining or improving our byproduct mining. Within the processing um, itself, uh, looking at yield improvement and things like scrap and waste recovery. In the manufacturing stage, uh, looking at substitution of some of these materials and what the potential for that might be, as well as dematerialization. So I said um, there's a lot of folks looking at decreasing those material intensities. Um, extending the lifespan can, can greatly help um, reduce overall impacts. Then, of course, looking at end of life, whether or not reuse is possible or recycling. And uh, some of these solution methods are uh, part of the, the rest of the research that I do. So um, this, is, this is just a quick snapshot, but um, other aspects are really focusing on some of these end of life and processing solutions in these material systems that we can use to both mitigate the criticality and scarcity of these materials, but also reduce the overall impacts of them. So I just want to quickly acknowledge all of my awesome students and colleagues who have helped with some of this work that I've talked about today. And just close with some, some information uh, about my research more broadly and uh, resources and skills that I'm looking for in terms of uh, collaboration and future students. So thanks so much for tuning in and I'll be able to um, take some questions uh, via the, the app. So if you wanna start typing those in, I can do that. So, okay. okay. Awesome. Hopefully everybody saw everything. Okay, let me just see if I can page up here. Hold on a sec, start at the beginning. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's see. Just looking through some of the questions. Oh yes, I see someone posted the resources for future generations. Yes, I've been I've been tweeting tweeting that. I wish I could go, but I'm actually an organizer for uh, MCare, which is also in Vancouver, uh, close to the same time. So I unfortunately couldn't go to both conferences. But MCare is uh, Material Challenges for Alternative and Renewable Energy, and so um, I. If anyone's interested in submitting abstracts to that, I also would recommend that one. But uh, resources for future generations is also awesome. Let me just page down a little bit. Um, oh yeah, I, that's an awesome point about the cumulative supply curves. Yeah, I completely agree um, that this you know static depletion type uh, metrics are usually not that useful because the systems are so dynamic. So yeah, I, I completely agree that the cumulative supply curves are, are definitely better. I think the reason that people tend to, to use the, um, the reserve over primary is because that data is more available. It can be extremely challenging to develop the cumulative supply curves, but obviously if you have that data and can put those together, those, those will absolutely tell you a lot more about the real availability. Uh, one of the additional complications there, though, is uh, how long the supply chains actually are. So if you if you look at battery materials, for example, you know you're starting with extracting of say lithium carbonate equivalents, and then those have to be further processed. And so you might actually have data that, and even a cumulative supply curve that's telling you, yeah, there's plenty that we're getting out, but the reality might be that getting it all the way to battery grade might actually uh, be very challenging and, and in and of itself has some, some supply problems. So, and, and particularly reserve over primary is not gonna tell you anything about that. Uh, so really having even more 
dynamic and sort of in-depth along the supply chain types of metrics is still uh, a needed area, I think. Does anyone have any other questions that they want to put in the, uh, the chat or the qu questions? Hold on, actually, hold on, I do see questions, hold on. Why can't I click on it? Let's see here. Actually, I don't, yeah, I don't see any other ones in the chat. Let's see here. Oh, somebody asked for a copy. Yeah, so um, I believe the webinars will be recorded and posted. And um, yeah, and I'm happy, I'm happy to share copies of the PowerPoint as well. Um, you can uh, send me an email. I'll actually type in my email address in here. Um, and that way you can uh, share with me your, uh, your request slash contact information. And I'd be happy to to pass that along, or any of the publications um, that are listed. I, I know some of them are behind paywalls. I think maybe the jewel, the jewel one about the lithium ion battery material supply chains might be, but I'm, I'm happy to share an author copy uh, with you uh, via email if you wanna send me a note. Any other questions? Thanks so much again for tuning in, and um, don't forget to uh, check out some of my colleagues' uh, presentations. Uh, that are coming up as well and I'm also happy to get into more sort of in-depth conversations about about any of these topics this was uh, meant to be kind of a an introductory uh, lecture to this this topical area so thanks so much for tuning in oh actually I think I might have a new question a sec. This doesn't like me clicking on it Oh, yeah. So do I agree the fact that some metals are byproducts is both an advantage and a disadvantage in terms of availability? Um, yeah, I mean, it's there. Yeah, there's definitely pros and cons to it for sure. Um, I think uh, the, the producers that I work for who sponsor some of my research would really only <laughs> Think about the disadvantage of it because they feel like they they don't really have the type of control of the supply chain that they would like to have. Um, but I think as people outside of um, you know directly having to produce those products, you know we have we have a slight advantage in terms of thinking a little bit more systems level and globally about it. And so um, yeah, I think I think there actually are some some large advantages. Part part of the problem though is for these materials in terms of taking advantage of waste and secondary sources, um, the, you know, we're dissipatively losing those minor metals because it's not economic to recover them from those wastes either, right? So um, it's, still, it's still a bit of a, a disadvantage to not be one of those, you know, base metals that has a large infrastructure for recovery built up around it. Um, I still think there's uh, a lot of potential there. I think the way things are right now, probably policymakers are going to have to intervene to incentivize um, extraction from those secondary sources just because the economics don't line up right now. Um, it, it's it's a little bit of a shame too because if there is some sort of price spike, you know, I, there's you know there's a lot happening in the DRC right now, for example. That could potentially cause uh, cobalt price spikes, and, and honestly, for the last year, cobalt prices have been increasing at, at a rapid rate. Anyway, even regardless of a, a more kind of concentrated event happening or anything like that, just from increased demand. Um, it, you know, it's a shame that people aren't kind of more forward thinking in terms of of building up that infrastructure now to be in place for when prices are higher and the economics align. Um, but we'll, we'll kind of see, see where things go. I mean, I know I, I was just at the IEA two weeks ago talking about the battery case, for example, and I know that the EU um, is, is very active in creating some of these incentives in a, in a policy way uh, for what they're perceiving to be a large source of those materials from EVs in the near future. So it would be really, really interesting to see what they do moving forward. Um, here in the U.S., the current uh, climate will probably not allow for any of that type of policy intervention. It's going to solely be based on economics of those recovery uh, facilities. So we'll probably be a little bit further behind in that circumstance. Um, here's another. Here's another question. Okay, 
Over the course of 2017, coal prices more than doubled. Yeah. Yep. So do you attribute this more to demand or supply factors? And how do you think the co-production dependence of cobalt will affect the market's ability to expand supply? I think I, this is a great question. So um, obviously, there's definitely a demand side to it um, that, that's very clear. You know, people, people have really been uh, making a lot of uh, you know, the OEMs have been saying they're going to produce more EVs and they've uh, set these uh, targets. A lot of countries have set targets for uh, getting rid of ICEs or internal combustion engines. And so, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, but of course, it's a commodity market. So there's also a lot of speculation. So investors, I think, are seeing um, these demand targets being put in. They're, you know, making investments accordingly. Um, and so uh, it's, it's kind of a mix of de demand and supply. For, for the producers, it's a little more complicated because it takes, it takes a long time to ramp up production. So I, I recently met with um, two or three folks working at Glencore, which is, which is the major cobalt producer in the DRC. And so they're, they're very worried because uh, they don't want to necessarily expand that production just based on these sort of targets that that people are setting because people actually buying the EVs may not follow those targets is is their thinking uh, on the subject so um, they really want to have MOUs in place so those are like memorandums of understanding between um, actual um, you know of the people who are gonna buy and even better they'd like offtake agreements which is where um, buyers are going to lock in with the supplier, and so I think I think part of it is that supply is being slow to expand because they're nervous and they want those offtake agreements and MOUs in place. Um, but definitely, I think the price in increase is due to speculation and demand together. Um, let's see here. Some other questions. Uh, do you foresee any materials experiencing similar price spikes in the near future and which ones? Yeah, um, well, I'd be, I'd be super rich if I knew this for sure because I'd get into that commodity market and make some investments and then I could retire next year and, and stop teaching. But sure, I, I definitely have some guesses. Um, I think um, want, um, cobalt's going to con continue to, to increase. I think probably uh, rhenium will see some price spikes from as well. Um, they, they've had price spikes in the past and just kind of their current supply demand situation. I think will probably um, uh, lead to some increases in the near future. Um, probably we'll see some, some base metal um, increases in, some, in certain uh, systems as well. Uh, potentially copper, although obviously that won't be as as extreme. Um, tin is one actually that is is less of a byproduct, but I would assume, given sort of rollout of certain technologies, that that one may be increasing. And then probably the biggest question mark is in the rare earths. So they're all extracted somewhat together, and because some of them um, are produced are in a higher concentration in those ore grades, things like lanthanum and cerium, they're going to continue to experience low prices while those sort of more kind of scarcer materials within those are going to continue to experience increase um, in prices. So things like uh, scandium and terbium and europium, uh, a lot of the phosphors um, as energy efficient lighting continues to, to be adopted more readily. And actually, there's a lot of policies around energy efficient lighting as well that are being rolled out. I definitely see demand going up there and uh, supply not necessarily being able to uh, respond as quickly, again, because of geographic concentration. Most of those are coming out of um, China right now. And there's definitely some struggles in terms of internal regulation there and sort of domestic uh, support in terms of incentives for mining there as well. So probably. Um, yeah, those are some. We'll see. Another question is thinking about mining in deep sea and space. Um, so I'm I'm super fascinated by that. Um, so certainly, you know, people have been talking about deep sea in 
you know, in the context of lithium for a long time because we just have tons of lithium in the ocean. Uh, the reality of that is just the, the, the cost is extremely prohibitive right now. So, I mean, you'd have to see really huge uh, material price spikes for people to even really start thinking about the reality of extraction from those systems. Um, there's, uh, if you're into public policy and sort of mining policy, I mean, there's some really fascinating questions around that, um, especially on the space front. So who owns space? Who owns these asteroids? There's actually been private companies who already have said, we, this asteroid belongs to us and we're looking at it. We're going to see if we can mine all these precious metals and rare earth elements that are, that are in these asteroids. You know, I don't, I don't really know where that is going in the future, but I find it extremely fascinating. And there's definitely a lot of very high value materials um, in, in um, some of those asteroids. And, but again, uh, the costs are just too extreme uh, for us to be seeing that anywhere in the next decade, but who knows what the future will hold. <laughs> Let me just see some of these. Um, Oh yeah, yeah. I would definitely be interested in a in a in a working group or yeah, getting a meeting together. We could do a workshop or something. I'd be very interested in that, and I'm I'd be happy to pursue um, some funding on the U.S. side for that because I think um, the EU is very very active. But the problem there is, you know, each of us are sort of in those individual communities. So it'd really be really great to to cross pollinate some of these ideas. Um, uh, someone made the comment that uh, some Dutch dredging companies are looking at deep sea mining. So that's that's awesome. Maybe it is closer closer than we think. We will we will see. Let me see. I think I might have missed some questions here. Hold on, having trouble scanning these up. Sorry. Can you can you help with that? I just want to page down on the questions a little bit more. Okay, awesome. Yeah, okay. Um, oh yeah, just a kind of more of a comment on calculating the cost of extraction from, from waste um, rather than adding cost of transportation. So um, yeah, this is, uh, this is also an area that I'm doing a lot of work in right now, understanding economies of scale for different either industrial byproducts or waste streams for getting some of these materials out. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's fairly complicated. So it, it really depends on um, how likely collection would be and then really the concentration of the individual materials in any of those streams. So Again, a lot of times we're already dissipatively losing those materials because there's, you know, not enough economic incentive to extract them uh, from those industrial byproduct or waste waste streams now. But yeah, again, the future, uh, who knows what the future will hold, and hopefully, we'll see more and more where it's not solely the economics incentivizing these types of efforts, um, but you know, with the goal of bringing down the environmental impacts of these extraction processes. Um, you know, hopefully that will help. But again, that's why I think policy intervention is going to be uh, really important uh, to be able to, to keep moving these things forward. Hold on. Just one second. I'm going back and forth between the chat and the, uh, <laughs> the questions. Um, Okay. To scroll. There we go. Oops. Hold on. Going the wrong way. Just one second. Okay, just can you scroll down now? Because I accidentally hit most recent. So, <laughs> yeah. So the ones lower are the new ones. Yeah, go all the way down. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. So, 
Uh, you guys are just kind of already discussing about kind of the policy considerations for deep sea mining. Yeah, I was a little more focused on the asteroids because I think that's kind of even harder. But yeah, I mean, um, for the for the deep sea mining, it's actually a little bit easier in terms of there's there's not that much international waters. From my understanding, I'm not an expert in this area, but um, you know, a lot of the ocean has been laid claim to. And so um, a lot of the governmental bodies already have kind of jurisdictional um, kind of law uh, that they can kind of refer to in terms of mining for those. But yeah, I mean, obviously it's, it's a lot more complicated than that because most of the companies doing extraction are these multinationals that have stakeholders in a variety of different countries and, you know, um, mining rights in and of themselves on land are quite complicated. So I would imagine it to be quite complicated in the case of, of the of deep sea as well. Um, yeah, I have talked to some of the Lockheed Martin people um, about their 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 deep sea tech. I mean, I don't. In terms of, of using, I, they have other reasons for developing some of those technologies, obviously, um, in terms of really using them to produce, you know, commodity materials. I, I do still think we're, we're, a little, we're a little far out on, on seeing that as part of the supply curve, but, you know, maybe, you know, maybe three to five years opportunistically, I'm not sure. <laughs> Sorry. Let me just go down there. Oh my God, it's come up. Just scroll down. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh. Oh yeah, no. That just for uh, some references to the deep sea mine. Yeah, it's super. It's super interesting. I can't. I can't wait to see what happens in that space. Well, uh, you'll have to keep us, keep us in the know. Uh, yeah, and I'm looking forward to the the workshop. Any anything else anybody wants to discuss or anything? Thanks again for tuning in, and you can definitely email me, and we can we can have some follow ups, and um, yeah, hopefully the the workshop will happen, and um, I will I will sign off for now. So thanks again, and uh, tune in to some of the other talks this week. <laughs>